Hi, everyone. My name is Matteo Guareschi, and I'm one of the GSC co-chairs for the academic year 23-24. Thank you all for being here today to celebrate the second and last annual Everhart Lecture. At the GSC, the Academics Committee recognizes academic excellence at Caltech, with particular importance given to the Everhart Lectures, hosted in collaboration with the Graduate Office. These lectures recognize two graduate students for their outstanding ability to communicate cutting edge research to a general audience. For a second lecture, we're proud to select Pei Wei Chen, who has just defended his PhD in biology. Unfortunately, Pei Wei's advisor, Alexei Aravin, could not join us today. So allow me to give you a brief introduction to Pei Wei and his work. Pei Wei was born and raised in Xiamen, China. Having spent the first 18 years of his life in Xiamen, he went to Hong Kong for college, where he picked up most of his English. He got his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and cell biology from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And he worked on muscle stem cells, macrophages, and Alzheimer's disease in undergrad. Thinking that he would study either stem cells or developmental biology, he came to Caltech for a PhD but he soon developed an interest in genetic conflicts and evolutionary biology. During his PhD, he studied the perpetual battles between selfish DNA and host genome in the tiny fruit flies. He doesn't have a pet, but he often thinks that the flies are just like his pets. He has to change the food for them all the time, and he always worries whether his flies are happy. Outside research, he's passionate about outreach and community service. He founded the Lab Equipment Access Program, or the LEAP project, here at Caltech, which helps underfunded high schools in rural, rural California get lab equipment and supplies from Caltech. He enjoys hiking. He loves checking out local coffee shops and boba shops. And he admits that he drinks more coffee and boba than he should. And now, Payway. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. It's truly an honor to give this Everhart Lecture. I'm actually graduating later this week, so it's a nice way to finish grad school here at Caltech. Perhaps all of us here have heard of a saying that the genome is the blueprint for life. Our DNA contains almost all the information needed for a single cell, a fertilized egg, to develop into an entire organism. We often think of each and every gene genome being turned on and off in a very precise way. And all the genes work together harmoniously to perform different functions. But counter to our intuition, and perhaps far from such a harmonious place, the genome is also a battleground where every bit of DNA has to fight for inheritance and for evolutionary survival. While most genes compete for inheritance by being good citizens of the genome, meaning most genes help the organism better survive, better reproduce, hoping that they can be inherited. Selfish genes, on the other hand, cheat the entire process by enhancing their own transmission at the expense of the host genome. This results in the so-called intragenomic conflicts between selfish genes and the rest of the genome. So rather than a harmonious place, our DNA is full of conflicts where different genes compete for inheritance. The idea that stretches of DNA can be selfish is not new but can actually date back to early landmark paper in the 70s and 80s, like the ones I'm showing you here. In particular, it was proposed by Ogo and Crick in 1980 that the selfish DNA is the ultimate parasite that lives within the genome. More than almost half a century later, we now know that selfish genes come in different shapes and forms. But many of them fall into one of the two categories. On one hand, we have overproliferators like transposons, which are these mobile genetic elements that can move around in the genome to increase the copy numbers. Because they can move around, they're also called the jumping gene. So they're shown as these jumping kangaroos here. With a higher copy number of themselves, they will, have higher, they will have a higher chance to be inherited to the next generation. But their activities or their jumping behaviors are detrimental for the host genome because they cause DNA damage and genome instability. So they must be silenced to protect genome integrity. But the fact that half or 50% of our own human DNA are transposon sequences should tell you that we are all witnessing the consequences of transposon overproliferation. Meanwhile, another type of selfish genes are called transmission disorders, such as sperm killers, which are selfish genes that distort equal transmission between homologs to bias their own inheritance. For example, in the male meiosis, 
we have one diploid cell that divides twice to generate four haploid cells, which then differentiate into mature sperm. According to Mendel's law, each haploid gamete contains either one of the two homologs. So for sex chromosomes, for example, each sperm either carry the X or the Y chromosome. And both the X and Y have 50% chance to be inherited. But if selfish genes on the X chromosome try to cheat, they can find ways to selectively kill the Y-bearing sperm, thereby increasing the chance of X chromosome to be inherited to more than 50%, sometimes almost 100%. This is a phenomenon that we call meiotic drive, which violates Mendel's law. And in this case, it's beneficial for the inheritance of S chromosome, but detrimental for Y inheritance and the overall reproductive success of an organism. Meiotic drive can be found anywhere in the genome, not just sex chromosomes, and it's certainly not a male-specific behavior. In fact, different types of transmission disorders often exploit distinct biology in male and female gametogenesis to bias their own inheritance. I hope you can appreciate that even though self genes are so diverse, many of them cause fertility defects, so they must be silenced to protect fertility. In fact, failing to silence just a single transposome can make an entire organism infertile. So it's absolutely essential to keep this diverse array of self genes in check to protect an organism's reproductive functions. In addition, self genes are also often lineage-specific, meaning they're different in different species. The transposons that are active in plants are different from the ones that are active in animals. And the transmission disorders that work in mice are different from the ones that work in human. So they really differ across lineages. But if they are so diverse and they look differently in different species, how can we control them? How can we control selfish genes that are lineage-specific? This is the guiding question of my talk. And today I'll tell you two strategies that different organisms use to control lineage-specific selfish genes. Now, from the work done in the last few decades, people have actually identified several so-called genome defense mechanisms that control diverse selfish genes. In animals in particular, many selfish genes are controlled by a conserved genome defense mechanism called the pyRNA pathway. At the core of the pyRNA pathway, we have a small non-coding RNA called pyRNA, showing dark blue here, which can load onto the peewee protein, showing light blue. The pyRNA can bring the peewee protein to find complementary target RNAs and silence their expression. For example, in the fruit fly, which is the organism I work on during my PhD, there are two peewee proteins called Albert and Eagle 3, which are endonucleases that can silence target expression by cleaving their RNAs. Their targets include different transposons and a selfish meiotic driver called Stele, which I'll talk more about today. Silencing this diverse array of selfish genes is absolutely essential to protect fertility. Now, the pi RNA pathway is actually remarkably complex with over 30 proteins identified to be dedicated to this single pathway in a fruit fly alone. But instead of walking you through this complica complicated pi RNA pathway and explaining to you what each of these 30 proteins does, I want you to focus on just the core components of pathway, which highlight a binary architecture of this genome defense mechanism. Specifically, we have a specificity factor, the pi RNA, shown in dark blue, which identifies the target. And the effector, the peewee protein, showing light blue, which silences the target. Such a binary core architecture of the pyramid pathway implies that the system is very programmable. Because by replacing just the pyramid sequences, the pathway can be used to control different targets. In other words, by innovating a new pyramid, the entire system can be directed against a new target, without any changes in effectors or other components of pathway. This idea is quite powerful when we think about the question, how does the pi pathway regulate a new target in evolution? Perhaps the key of an answer to this question lies in the pi RNA, the specificity factor. Because if we want to regulate a new target, we probably need to evolve a new pi RNA. In other words, if you look at the pi RNA repertoire here, the collection of all the pi RNA sequences, we might find new pi RNAs that recognize new targets in a given species. And I approach this question by looking at the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, which is an organism that many, pe many people study in the lab. This is because they are very genetically tractable. What I mean by that is that we have a rather good idea of the DNA sequences of the fly, and we can precisely manipulate the fly DNA and see what happens. Over the years, the insights we learned from studying flies has been broadly applicable to many other organisms, including us humans. This is why many people study flies for different biological questions. Now, before I go ahead and show you some data, I also want to point out that 
When I first came to this field about six years ago, most people have primarily studied pyRNAs in female flies. We know much less about pyRNAs in male flies. So I wanted to first do a systematic analysis of all the pyRNAs in males and see if I can find any new pyRNAs. And an interesting place to look is the Y chromosome. Because if everyone looks at the female, no one has to look at the Y chromosome very closely. Here I'm showing you a map of the Y chromosome with the genomic coordinates showing top and protein coding gene showing color blue. If I sequence the pyRNAs and map them to the Y chromosome, here's what I see. I see two classes of pyRNAs that correspond to a known pyRNA species called suppressor stellae, which target the stellae genes that I briefly mentioned earlier. But there's a third class of pyRNAs that no one has seen before. So I was quite excited that we just identified a new pyRNA locus on the Y chromosome. Now, if we zoom into this locus, here's what we see. We see that this locus is full of transposon sequences, which is not necessarily surprising because the Y chromosomes often have many transposons. And the pyRNAs are also known to primarily target transposons. But even though there are many transposon sequences at this locus, they actually do not occupy all the space at this locus. We can often find gaps between transposon annotations that also produce a lot of pyRNAs, like the gaps here. So I went into all these gaps between transposon annotations and see what they are. Turns out many of them contain homology to a single protein coding gene called CG12717. In flies, all the uncharacterized genes are named by CG followed by a number. It just means that this gene hasn't really been studied before, so it doesn't even have a name yet. It's important to know that all of these homology to CG12717 seem to be gene fragments with very limited protein coding potential. So we don't think any of them encode proteins, but instead they might produce pyRNAs to regular expression of this CG gene. In other words, this locus on the Y chromosome produces pyRNA to target not just transposons, but also this CG gene. So I wonder whether the pyRNAs produced here were regular expression of CG12717. To check this, I did RNA-seq to quantify the expression of all the RNAs in the cell. And here I'm showing you specifically the expression of this CG gene on the Y axis. We're looking at both the control males and three different pyRNA pathway mutants. The expectation is that if this gene is silenced by the pyRNA pathway, we should see a higher expression in pyRNA pathway mutants than control. And this is indeed what we saw. We see a much higher expression of CG12717 when the pyRNA pathway is mutated, suggesting that this gene is indeed silenced by pyRNAs. We decided to name this gene PIRATE, which stands for pyRNA target in testes. Consistent with the fact that most pyRNAs that target pyrate come from the Y chromosome, we can also derepress the expression of pyrate gene by removing the Y chromosome without mutating any pyRNA pathway machinery. As you can see, males that don't have the Y chromosome have a much stronger expression of the pyrate gene. And the pyrate gene is specifically expressed in differentiating spermatocytes, but not in earlier stages of sperm development. It's cool that we can derepress the pyrate gene by just removing the Y chromosome but I wanted to further map the location of these pyRNAs on the Y chromosome. So I asked, can pyrate silencing pyRNAs be, be assigned to a single region on the Y chromosome? Here I'm showing you a cytological map of the entire Y chromosome, where the Y chromosome is divided into 25 regions based on this characteristic standing pattern. Based on different analysis, we infer that this pyRNA locus resides around region 17. Now, using tools from classical Drosophila genetics, we can generate a series of deletions, or so-called segmental deficiencies, that lack each of the seven consecutive regions that span the entire Y chromosome. For example, we can generate a Y chromosome that lacks just this part of the Y, or another one that lacks this part. But only when we remove this region of the Y chromosome do we see a derepression of the pyrogene, gene, suggesting that most, if not all, pyrosilencing pyRNAs come from this region on the Y. We name this locus petrol which stands for proximal to fertility regions on the Y long arm, which is a rather lengthy description of its physical location on the Y chromosome. But for those who don't know, the word petrol also refers to a type of seabird whose appearance predicts bad weather on the ocean. So we think seeing the petrol birds must be a terrible news for pirates, because it tells them that a storm is coming, just like the petrol pyRNA will soon bring the period protein to destroy pyro RNAs. We were excited by the fact that we discovered a new pyRNA that silences a new target. But the next question I ask is how did it evolve? Because we're interested in the question of how does the pyRNA pathway regulate a new target, we're naturally interested in the evolutionary history of the pyrogene and petrol pyRNA. 
one thing you can do is to do the so-called BLAST searches to look for homology of a gene of interest. In other words, we look for things in the genome that look similar to the genes we're interested in. This is, this is because many genes evolve through duplications. So if we can figure out whether pyrene and petrol duplicated from something else, we can probably make some inferences about how they evolve. When I look for homology of the pyrene gene, I found that it looks very similar to another gene called Velo in the fly genome. Both pyrene and Velo encode this ULP2 clade sumoprotease domain. So these two parts of these two proteins look very similar to each other, and they both seem to encode the sumoprotease. So I wanted to look at the evolutionary history of both the pyrene gene and the Velo gene. Turns out, Velo seems to be a deeply conserved gene that can be found from yeast to human. Here I'm showing you a phylogenetic tree of many fly species that cover about 60 million years of evolution. As you can see, the Velo gene is found in all the fly species that are surveyed. On the other hand, the pyrene gene seems to be much younger and evolved through the duplication of the Velo gene. In all the fly species that we can see the pyrene gene, we can find a, a syntani location between AGPAT1 and PAX genes. But all, in all the other fly species that don't have the pyrene gene, these two genes are direct neighbors to each other, which suggests that pyrene evolved through duplication into this genomic neighborhood around this time, after the split of the mountain subgroup and oriental lineage. While in most species that have the pyrene gene, we can only find one copy of the gene, there are a few species that have additional pyrene homologies in the heterochromatin. They are in just a few species that are closely related to Drosophila melanogaster, the organism that I study. In fact, in Drosophila melanogaster, all of the pyrene homology we find in heterochromatin are found at this petrol locus on the Y chromosome, which I just told you about, which suggests that petrol evolved from duplication of pyrene gene, and it contains fragments of pyrene duplicates, which encode prior RNAs rather than proteins to regulate the expression of pyrene gene. In addition, the petrol locus seems to have evolved very recently because it's only found in Drosophila melanogaster, but not in any other species. So we think petrol pyrene represents a recent innovation of a new specificity factor to recognize a new target. This inspired us to ask whether these other heterochromatic duplicates of pyrene in other species might also produce small RNAs to recognize pyrene. You know, even though these additional pyrene homologies are found in different places in different species, they can still produce small RNAs to target pyrene, just like what we see in Drosophila melanogaster. To check these, I sequenced small RNAs from these fly species. Even though I did not see any small RNAs against the pyrene gene in similar instance of Shilia, I was quite surprised to find sRNAs that target pyrene in Mauritiana. sRNAs list primarily 21 nucleotidal small RNAs, just slightly shorter than their pyrene counterparts. This, this suggests the sRNA pathway probably regulates expression of pyrene gene in Drosophila mauritiana. This is really exciting because, because we think it represents a case of phenotypic convergence where two species independently recruited two different pathways to regulate the same gene in recent evolution. If a gene is regulated by two different mechanisms in two species in recent evolution, it likely suggests that silencing this gene is very important. Now, putting this part together, when we think about how the system evolved, we think it first started from G duplication events that gave rise to paralogs. Because Velo is deeply conserved, we think it's a parental gene that gave rise to a younger paralog, pyrene. Through mechanisms that we don't fully understand yet, pyrene was brought into repeat rich heterochromatin, where they are further duplicated locally and even fragmentized. Some of these heterochromatic duplicates of pyrene can in turn produce small RNAs to silence the pyrene gene. This is done by pyRNAs in Drosophila melanogaster, but by sRNAs in Drosophila mauritiana. We envision that this can be a very general mechanism to generate novelty in small RNA function. While people often focus on gene duplication, producing paralogous proteins that execute either similar or distinct functions, here we're seeing gene duplication providing templates or substrates for small RNA production, which can in turn silence the parental gene that they evolved from. Even though my work fo focuses on the fly species, if we look into more branches on the tree of life, into more animal clades, we're very likely to find other examples of such recently evolved novelty in small RNA functions. It's satisfying to have some idea of how pyrene and petrol evolve, but all of this back to the question of why did it evolve? Why did petrol pyrene evolve to silence the expression of the pyrene gene? 
In fact, this remains an open question what drove the evolution of pirate silencing pioneers. What I haven't told you is that the pirate gene actually resides on the S chromosome, and they are silenced by y link petrol pioneers. This reminds me of the sex chromosome conflict that I mentioned earlier, where the selfish S chromosome could sabotage the inheritance of the Y chromosome. Just to remind you, according to Mendel's law, we normally have equal transmission of X and Y. A male typically makes half, half sperm that carry the X chromosome and another half that carry the Y. But if a selfish S chromosome tries to cheat, they can find ways to selectively kill the Y-bearing sperm, thereby increasing the chance of S chromosome to be inherited. This results in sex ratio meiotic drive, where we see distorted and, tr di and biased transmission of S chromosome. In order for the Y chromosome to survive in evolution and defend its own inheritance, it has to quickly come up with ways to suppress the selfish behavior of the X chromosome, to suppress meiotic drive to restore this equal transmission between X and Y. We're currently working under the hypothesis that pirate might be a selfish meiotic driver which is sabotage the Y inheritance, which selects for the innovation on the Y chromosome, such as pyRNAs, to tend pirate expression and defend Y inheritance. Please stay tuned for more updates as we continue to work on this puzzle. But to sum up the first half of my talk, when we think about the question, how does the pi pathway regulate a new target? We think the key lies in the innovation of a specificity factor, like a new pi RNA, which can allow the conserved pi pathway protein machinery to recognize and suppress a new target. And when we think about how new pyrenees can evolve, this can evolve through things like gene duplication, which can happen within a rather short period of evolutionary time. The idea that innovation of a new specificity factor is often associated with the control of a new target is quite powerful because it stands beyond the pi pathway. This is because the binary core architecture I told you about of the pi pathway is also shared by many other defense pathways. For example, in eukaryotes, I briefly mentioned that there's another small RNA pathway called the sRNA pathway, where the sRNA identifies a target, while agro protein silences a target. In bacteria, we have guide RNA identifying the targets, and Cas9 silences the target. In many tetrapods, including mammals and us humans, we have different Krebs zinc finger proteins, or Krebs ZFPs, each of which can recognize different transposon sequences. But the silencing of those transposons is mediated by a shared cofactor called Cap1. Perhaps because of this conserved binary core architecture we see across many defense pathways in many organisms, where a new specificity factor, shown in dark blue here, can be easily innovated to recognize a new target. When people think about how to control lineage-specific selfish genes, we have almost always focused on the evolution of these new specificity factors. In other words, our current understanding of genome defense against lineage-specific selfish genes has been largely limited to innovations of specificity factors. But I wonder whether well, genome defense might require other types of innovation beyond specificity factors. You know, outside these factors that can re recognize the emerging selfish genes, we really, we really know rather little about how recently evolved selfish genes are controlled. In the second half of my talk, I will tell you a new type of innovation that we identified which controls recently evolved selfish genes. To approach this question, I focus on a recently evolved selfish gene called Stele, which I mentioned earlier. Stele is only found in Drosophila melanogaster, but despite its recent emergence, silencing Stele is absolutely essential for male fertility. The Stele RNA is recognized by the so-called suppressor Stele pi RNA, a new specificity factor, which is also recently evolved and only found in Drosophila melanogaster and it protects the male fertility. In this case, the innovation of a new pi RNA allows the conserved pi pathway reporting machinery to recognize and suppress Stele. But since the discovery of suppressor Stele pi RNA over 20 years ago, the entire field has, consumed, has assumed that controlling Stele is done solely by the innovation of this new pi RNA, a new specificity factor. We do not know any other innovations that are required to control Stele. But because Stele has such a strong reproductive impact on reproduction, and the suppressor Stele power is actually remarkably abundant, we hypothesize that there might be other types of innovation that are required to control Stele. So I decided to look for other unknown repressors of Stele, which might contain other types of innovations. So we did a genetic screen to look for unknown Stele repressors. Essentially, we perturb the expression of different candidate genes and ask which one affects the silencing of Stele. This might sound like tedious, 
and not rather naive, but a genetic screen approach can be quite powerful to uncover the genetic architecture of a process, especially in organisms like Drosophila melanogaster, where we have the tools in community to perturb literally every single gene in the genome. The screen was done by an extremely talented undergrad student, Eunice, who did in situ to visualize the expression of Stelae. Stelae is completely silenced in wild-type testes, but highly expressed when it's not silenced. Eunice did this screen in the summer of 2022, and one day I was working on campus when she sent me this photo without saying anything else. So I asked her whether this was the positive control. She told me, no, it's actually a heat from the screen. And I should say, this was the first time I did a genetic screen in my life, so I couldn't believe it that we actually find something. So I repeated everything, did a bunch of controls, and we even generated mutants for this gene. Finally, we convinced ourselves that we indeed discovered a new genome defense factor that is required for stellate silencing. We decided to name this gene Trailblazer because we like to think that it's a pioneer that controls recently evolved selfish genes. Consistent with the fact that stellate silencing is required for male fertility, we found that males that don't have trailblazer almost never produce any progeny, so they're completely sterile, while females don't really seem to care whether they have trailblazer or not. This is quite exciting because I told you earlier that there have been over 30 proteins identified to be dedicated to the pi pathway. But what I didn't tell you is that all of the 30 proteins actually disproportionately protect female fertility. We almost always see a much weaker phenotype in males so it's quite exciting that we found the first factor that specifically protects male fertility. Importantly, such male infertility we see upon trailblazer depletion can be rescued if we also deplete stellate at the same time, suggesting that stellate depression is the cause of male infertility we see upon trailblazer knockdown. I want to take a step further and ask, how does trailblazer facilitate stellate silencing? How does it work? What is the mechanism? To answer this, I profiled a transcriptome of males that don't have trailblazer and found about 30 genes that are differentially expressed across the entire genome, shown as the red dots here, which include the strongly derepressed DELA genes. Interestingly, two genes that are downregulated are actually ALP and AGO3, the two endonucleases I told you earlier that can silence DELA by cleaving their RNAs. But if ALP and AGO3 proteins themselves have no target specificity, why is DELA silencing particularly sensitive to a loss of albinago 3 What I haven't told you is that Stele is actually a multi-copy gene that can have over 200 copies in the genome. So the transcripts are extremely abundant, which likely require a large number of albinago 3 proteins to efficiently silence. Consistent with this idea, the male infertility we see upon trailblazer knockdown can also be rescued if we express additional ALP or ago 3 protein indicating that trailblazer facilitates stellate silencing by promoting the expression of albinago 3 But how does it do this? How does it promote the expression of albinago 3 When I imaged the trailblazer protein, I found that it's a nuclear protein that binds chromatin and actually forms foci on DNA. So I wonder whether it directly binds the promoter of albinago 3 To check this, I did a so-called CHIP-C experiment to profile the genome-wide binding of the trailblazer protein on DNA. And I, found about, and I found about 3,000 binding sites across the entire genome. While most of these trailblazer binding sites have very weak trailblazer binding, there are a few places that are bound by trailblazer very strongly. Excitingly, across the entire genome, the two strongest binding sites of trailblazer are the promoters of albinago 3 genes, indicating that trailblazer is a transcription factor for albinago 3 So we think trailblazer protein directly binds the promoter of these two genes and activates their transcription. This is exciting because trailblazer is one of the very few transcription factors we know that activate germline-specific genes. Some of you here might be familiar with the idea that different cell types often express different transcription factors to activate cell type-specific genes. But turns out many germline proteins are repressors of somatic genes rather than positive regulators of germline-specific genes. So we're quite excited that we, as we coincidentally identified a positive regulator of germline-specific genes. It's satisfying to have some idea of how trailblazer works to silence stellate, but I wonder how did it evolve? I mentioned earlier that stellate is a lineage-specific selfish gene only found in Drosophila melanogaster. So initially, I was really hoping that trailblazer would also be a young gene that was born rather recently. But however, trailblazer seems to be an older gene that can be found in many fly species. So I wonder whether trailblazer might contain or reflect 
evolutionary adaptation to control its lineage-specific selfish genes. One way to check this is to ask whether a close ortholog that diverged very recently can functionally substitute trailblazer function in melanogaster. To check this, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to replace the trailblazer gene by a close ortholog from a sibling species called Drosophila simulans, which diverged about 3 million years ago. This was done by another talented undergrad student, Catherine, who was truly a CRISPR wizard because she could insert, delete, or replace almost anything, almost anywhere in the genome. So I always feel really lucky to have worked with her. And after engineering genomes and making these precise surgical changes to DNA for a couple of years in the lab, Catherine is now at Harvard Medical School working towards becoming a surgeon. So I couldn't be more proud of her. After we replaced the trailblazer gene by the stimulus allele, we actually found that it fails to silence Stelly. And this led to complete male infertility, suggesting that this close ortholog that diverged very, very recently is unable to substitute trailblazer function in melanogaster. Importantly, such fertility defects we see can also be rescued if we knock down Stelly or express additional ALP or AGO3 protein, indicating that these fertility defects we see upon the evolutionary swap results from the inability of stimulants trailblazer protein to activate sufficient ALP and AGO3 protein to silence Stelly. In other words, within their likely recent adaptive changes within the trailblazer protein, they are required to upregulate ALP and AGO3 to silence Stelly and protect male fertility. But I wonder, where are these adaptive changes within the trailblazer protein? In other words, where does evolution act on trailblazer? The trailblazer protein has a structured N-terminal region and an unstructured middle region, both of which can activate transcription. It also has a zinc finger domain at the C terminus, which presumably binds DNA. In order to pinpoint the critical evolutionary changes within the trailblazer protein, we collaborated with the population geneticist at UC Irvine, Grace Lee, to perform the so-called McDonald Quamen tests to look for signals of positive selection within trailblazer. Essentially, we're looking at 100 amino acid sliding windows against the entire protein. But excitingly, we find a single window within the DNA binding domain that shows signals of positive selection. Specifically, we see an excess of non-synonymous substitutions that are fixed between Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila stimulans, which suggests a history of adaptive evolution in the DNA binding domain. This is exciting, but in order to empirically interrogate the functional impacts of these evolutionary changes, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to replace each of the three domains of the trailblazer protein by orthologous sequences from stimulants. Excitingly, replacing just the zinc finger domain was, turns out to be both necessary and sufficient to disrupt stele silencing, which suggests that most critical evolutionary changes within the trailblazer protein occur within the DNA binding domain, which presumably upregulate ALP and 3 to silence stele. Now, putting everything together, we think ancestrally, when stele first emerged, by the innovation of the suppressor stele pyRNA, a new specificity factor, the conserved the pyRNA pathway protein machinery was able to recognize and suppress stele. But the selfish stele gene underwent a radical copy number expansion, producing extremely abundant transcripts that ultimately surpassed the silencing capacity of the pyRNA pathway. This is where the trailblazer protein came in. With its recent adaptive changes within the DNA binding domain, it was able to upregulate ALP and 3 and silence stele, protect male fertility. In this sense, we think rather than being a target-specific repressor, Trailblazer might be a higher-level modulator, which adjusts the amount of general defense machinery to match the abundance of selfish stellar genes. And to answer the question I posed earlier, we think genome defense does require innovations beyond specificity factors. In the case of stellar silencing, in addition to the innovation of a new pyRNA, innovation within Trailblazer protein is also essential to upregulate Albert Eagle 3 to silence Stelly. We think tuning the general defense machinery to match selfish genes in abundance might be a recurring employee strategy in genome defense. I told you about our discovery of the trailblazer protein, which tunes the pi pathway to silence suspended Stelly genes. But in Drosophila stimulants, there's actually a different selfish gene family called DOX, which also underwent a recent copy number expansion. The DOX genes are recognized by recently evolved sRNAs, and they are silenced by AGO protein. In many tetrapods, we have different families of ritual transposons undergoing lineage-specific copy number expansion, and they are recognized by recently duplicated Krebs zinc finger proteins 
and silenced by CAP1. While people have always focused on identifying individual SRAs, individual CRAP ZFPs, they recognize the emerging selfish genes. Our work put the important tuning of the expression of AGO protein and CAP1 protein to enable a robust genome defense. Even more broadly, in many organisms we see across the tree of life, we see ampliconic selfish genes accompanied by co-amplifying co suppressors. So we envision that this higher level tuning of the general target non-specific defense machinery might be a widespread phenomenon across taxa and a central strategy in the evolutionary battles against the expanding selfish genes. In summary, today I told you about a different way to think of the genome, to think of it as a genomic battleground where different elements compete for inheritance. And there are genes that may be selfish, which must be kept in check by different genome defense mechanisms. Because selfish genes differ across lineages and look differently in different species, a key question is how to regulate or control lineage-specific selfish genes. I told you two stories that highlight two different defense strategies. In the first half of my talk, I told you about this well-recognized defense strategy in innovating new specificity factors. I told you about our discovery of the petrol pyRNA, which evolved very recently on the Y chromosome of Drosophila melanogaster, and they control the X-linked gene pyrene. The idea that innovation of new specificity factors is often associated with, with control for new targets is quite powerful because it extends beyond the pyRNA pathway and beyond the fly species that I study. For virtually any genome defense mechanisms in almost any animals, we can go from the innovation of the specificity factor to identify lineage-specific selfish genes. So if you go to a new species, we can identify the selfish genes in that species by looking at the specificity factors, especially the ones that recently evolved. In the second half of my talk, I went over innovations beyond specificity factors. I spent most of my time describing a new type of innovation that we identified, where the trailblazer protein upregulates the, the amount of general defense machinery to augment the silencing capacity of the pyRNA pathway to tame these expanded selfish genes. Because copy number expansion is a recurrent feature of diverse selfish genes we see across the tree of life, we envision that this is likely a very conserved defense strategy that is used over and over again in evolution. While we're very excited about this one type of innovation, there are likely many other types of innovations beyond specificity factors that are waiting to be discovered. So if you're looking to more selfish genes in more species, we'll likely uncover other types of innovation in genome defense. Together, these different types of innovation in the genome defense allow the organisms to tame diverse beasts within the genome, to keep different classes of selfish genes in track, to protect genome integrity, animal fertility, and species continuity. While much work has focused on deep conservation, where people often approximate conservation with functional significance, perhaps there's a lot more to learn from rapid evolution and recent innovation. In many cases, it's precisely the recently evolved lineage-specific innovations, which are by definition unconserved, they are important for a biological process like genome defense. By continuing to study these perpetual battles between selfish DNA and host genome, we're likely to uncover generalizable principles that could transform our understanding of the natural world and net determinants of human reproductive health. With that, I want to thank many people First and foremost, I want to thank my advisor, Alexei Erevin, who, is been, who has been extremely supportive. Alexei gave me a tremendous amount of intellectual freedom during grad school, and I simply would not be the scientist I am today without his mentorship, support, and guidance. I also want to thank my thesis committee members and many faculty at Caltech. Many of them helped me with different things over the years. I also had the fortune to work with extremely talented undergrad students and I had a chance to briefly highlight the work of Catherine and Eunice. I have absolutely wonderful lemmates that make working in the lab every day fun and enjoyable, so I want to give all of them a shout out. And of course, my community extends well beyond Caltech. Over the years, I had the pleasure of working with many collaborators and colleagues who are also my inspirations. I don't have the time to thank them individually here, but I can easily name something I learned from each one of them. Finally, I want to thank the generous funding sources that made everything possible. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have.